Well, by now you've surely seen the video of all the crybaby SJWs running around the cities, causing millions of dollars in property damage everywhere, banging their fists because the system's broken and they didn't get their way. Well, we're starting to see a pattern. A lot of these people weren't even registered to vote, or if they were, they didn't even bother to cast a ballot. Yes, here's a story coming out of Portland. Uh, they say more than 70% of the 112 protesters that were arrested uh, this past week didn't even vote. They weren't even on the state election records. At least 79 demonstrators either didn't turn in a ballot, they weren't registered to vote in the state. Now, this is, of course, thousands of people that took to the streets there in Portland. Um, the police declared at least one of those nights to be a riot. Like I said, they caused more than a million dollars in property damage, and they arrested a bunch of people Friday and Saturday night and kind of held them. Well, 39 of those protesters who were arrested were registered in the state, but they didn't return a ballot for the election. 36 of the demonstrators taken into custody custody weren't even registered to vote in Oregon. Four of them were under the age of 18, so they couldn't even vote. 33 of the protesters did vote, so they were rightly upset about how they feel uh, this injustice happened. But it's just like Colin Kaepernick. He went and made this big show, didn't uh, stand for the Pledge of Allegiance or cover his heart or anything, took a knee. He didn't even bother to vote. So here they are bitching about a broken system, and yet they don't even participate. And then we have 60 Minutes talking to Donald Trump, asking him to condemn his violent supporters who are harassing people, although we've uh, found out later some of those turned out to be total hoaxes. But yet they're not asking Obama or Hillary Clinton to condemn these violent protesters who are kicking people's butts. Some people have been beaten to death, a veteran actually, causing tons of property damage. They're totally silent. Where is Hillary Clinton? Well, Alex Jones has, a, has an idea. Well, Hillary Clinton's been missing since she had a reported meltdown last week that we're going to break down in a moment. But suddenly she's going to reappear tomorrow at the Children's Defense Fund, a charity for children. I'm sure they're wonderful folks over there. But think about Sandusky, who ran a children's organization for troubled children there at Penn State that reportedly supplied children to the rich and powerful. You see, it's a big, sickening club, and we ain't in it. And it's Hillary that's been tied to the satanic organizations and satanic rituals uh, being conducted by the elite. We've caught them in Europe doing it. We've caught the British royalty involved, Jimmy Savelle. We've caught top leaders in Europe being involved in this sick practice as well. But what I do know is uh, there is a lot of law enforcement investigations going on concerning WikiLeaks uh, into uh, these type of activities. So I think the fact that Hillary is involved with this reputable children's organization should be cause for concern because this is a woman who turned ISIS loose in Syria and in Libya and they enslave little girls into sex slavery. They kill people by the hundreds of thousands. They cut up bodies of soldiers and made other Muslims eat it before they were uh, executed, believing it would send them to hell in a Islamic satanic ceremony that Wahhabis carry out. Wahhabism is a form of high level black magic Satanism. And so what's incredible here is we know she launched mass murdering wars. She came, she saw, they died. We came, we saw, he died. <laughs> did it have anything to do with your visit? No, oh, I'm sure it did. We know she stole glory and claimed that she was a hero like Brian Williams with her airplanes being shot down and you know, all of it was a total lie. Uh, we know she's a warmongering fraud and we know she's connected to people like Bill Clinton uh, who settled rape cases with women. So where there's smoke, there's fire. So it's sickening that she always associates herself with children and innocence uh, in these sickening PR events and everyone that gives aid and comfort to her, even though you may not be involved in the child abuse, by extension, are now aiding and abetting it. I thought I'd hit a few more stories here. We had already published this today when an article came out in the Daily Mail about it later, uh, just showing how much credibility there is to this uh, from the sources that uh, some of the reporters out there have with CNN. This is out of the Daily Mail, exclusive blow up. Days before losing the election, Hillary and Bill had a screaming match over who to blame for her flagging campaign. The ex-president got so angry, he threw his phone off the roof of the Arkansas penthouse. I've interviewed multiple Secret Service agents that talked about her hitting Secret Service agents in the back of the head with books, beating uh, Clinton with marble ashtrays and more, showing how unstable uh, this woman was. Uh, it's been admitted. Well, now we have a report on Infowars.com uh, from CNN reporters that say they were blocked from talking about Hillary in the bunker the last few weeks. 
like Hitler in the bunker, and how she was blowing up and flipping out. That story's on Infowars.com. Hillary became physically violent after she realized she had lost the election. Clinton had a be briefly restrained after trying to attack her own campaign staff and then it goes into how she had to be sedated we talked about on election night the word was she had to be sedated and that's why podesta had to come out and represent her something that's never done you always see the person that loses come out that night or that morning and make a concession but she didn't ladies and gentlemen because she was reportedly in a drunken drugged out of control state so hillary clinton comes back from out of the dark like a moray eel to slither around a bunch of children and make it look like she's not a mass murderer. And in closing, I'll leave you with her Secretary of State, Madeleine Albright, when they doubled the sanctions on the Iraqis that even Herbert Walker Bush had done and admittedly killed a half million children. I wonder if she'll get an award for that. We have heard that a half a million children have died. I mean, that's more children than died when, when, in, in Hiroshima. And, and, you know, is the price worth it? I think this is a very hard choice, but the price, we think the price is worth it. Well, now that they've spent the better half of a year dismantling the First Amendment, all of a sudden the media is once again concerned about freedom of speech. Uh, this is a Washington Post article posted Sunday. Our First Amendment test is here. We can't afford to flunk it. Now, the Federalist has a great article up. They, they always do. Uh, you know, they're arguing about the fact, you know, Donald Trump has made some really troubling remarks at times. He's kind of a cavalier toward free speech when it comes to dealing with the mainstream media because he says, you guys, are totally biased and unfair uh, but this is the media who's saying it's time to you know the test is here are we really gonna fight for the First Amendment this is the same media that spent eight years enabling and encouraging the Obama administration to just do whatever they wanted and they would protect them so this is for instance Hillary Clinton running on overturning Citizens United if you'll recall they say Citizens United allows for dark money to influence our elections but the case itself concerned a nonprofit that produced a documentary critical of Hillary Clinton ahead of the 2008 Democratic primary. So they're basically arguing that any corporation, including the New York Times, CNN, HarperCollins, that does political coverage, uh, political speech, they should be they should be part of this as Citizens United. They should be disallowed. Uh, they also completely ignored the fact that um, the IRS was targeting conservatives. The press kind of just swept that one under the rug. And of course, uh, they, they talk about how Obama's national security fabulist Ben Rhodes actually crafted a false narrative about political moderation in Iran to try to sell this unpopular and unworkable Iran nuclear deal. So this is a press that is, of course, pushing the left. We see um, college campuses across the country, how we're seeing students being put in their safe rooms. They are shouting down administrators who dare challenge them. They are t uh, shutting out conservative speakers, boycotting any conservatives, anyone that would come and say some form of, of speech that's different from what they want to view. They got safe spaces, trigger warnings. NPR actually issued a trigger warning before one of their articles as well. You know, it might, this might hurt you, it might upset you, trigger warning. That's why 70% of people do not trust the media because they can see that you guys are driving the wrong narrative and being very deceptive, if not outright lying. But check this. So now Google and Facebook are moving to restrict ads on fake news sites. So you're hearing a lot of flack about how Facebook was the one who kind of threw the election in favor of Donald Trump because they failed to uh, filter out all of this fake news and they were allowed to push all these fake stories. And this is like really taking, taking heat. But of course, it's the establishment media who says everything apart from itself is fake. It came out in the WikiLeaks that George Soros, the White House, Hillary, EU bureaucrats and others were going to counter the Brexit movement. England never voted to join the EU, so now they're trying to get out. We're going to counter that movement, our sovereignty movement headed up by Trump and other sovereignty movements around the world by saying we're racist, we're terrorist, we're evil, and our free speech on the web has to be curtailed.
But because they didn't get the presidency won, and because they now won't get the Supreme Court so they can restrict free speech as fast as they wanted to, we now know the new scam. Facebook, Twitter, Google, they've all announced, along with the New York Times, a war on fake news. And they're going to, through the browsers, through the internet service companies, try to block you getting to websites news sites and other ad sites that have fake news and information. What's happening is very, very simple. Mainstream dinosaur discredited media that had fake pollsters and fake media analysts and all the disinformation that's been totally repudiated and proven to be a lie. They weren't wrong. They were congenital liars on purpose. Their now desperate attempt is to flood the web through third-party sites they control with so much fake news and disinformation that it discredits the entire web itself, and then they will preside over the false flag they've staged and claim that only they can be trusted when everyone knows they're the most untrusted news sources out there. Before the election debacle, they only had a 6% trust rate, according to the Associated Press, in a national study. Now it's got to be in negative numbers if that's possible. Now, I showed everybody an example over the weekend of Amy Schumer running a so-called advertorial. Looked like an article, but, but, but it was an ad. And in it, she says, oh, I'm not really leaving the country. Let me clarify. So that's lie number one. Then they have this fake newspaper clipping where Donald Trump says, I hate my constituents. I hate conservatives. Fox News has you know, got a bunch of idiots. I'm going to con you, basically. And at the end of the article, she admits it's a fake quote knowing that 90% of people don't read to the end of the article. That's the fake news being put out on their servers by Google, by Twitter, by Facebook, by Yahoo. A hundred times out of one, and, and I'm being conservative, do I see it where libertarians or conservatives are putting out the fake news? It's these people. So that's their plan. Put out a bunch of fake news. Then come in and go, oh, my God, look at all the fake news, and then try to discredit the entire web, saying only trust us, only come to us. Now, there are cases of 100% blatant fake news, like the Amy Schumer example. Still, there are other fake news examples, like the one in the New York Times today that attacked yours truly, that said, quote, globalism, a far-right conspiracy theory buoyed by Trump. Globalism is the admitted planetary corporate world system establishing a technocracy for a, quote, world government. This has been in thousands of publications, including The Economist, Time Magazine, The New York Post, uh, The Wall Street Journal, The Financial Times of London, and now for world government and how great it is and how it's autocratic, how it's authoritarian, throwing it in our face over and over again but then coming out in a lengthy seven-page article and saying that I and others literally imagined the TPP, imagined NAFTA and GATT, imagined the World Trade Organization. Talk about fake news. They are denying the main political system and revolution of the last 60 years pushed by the Rockefellers and others. They think you're stupid and you haven't read David Rockefeller's book he published eight years ago where he openly admits that he's guilty as charged setting up global government. It's all over C-SPAN. We have hours and hours of world leaders saying we're establishing a world government. But out of one side of their mouth, they say it doesn't exist. Out of the other side, Obama comes out and says, we can't have crude nationalism and we must guard against it. So Alex Jones and Donald Trump say guard against unelected multinational corporate boards taking over, like TPP, unpopular on the left and right, and he responds, it doesn't exist, even though it does exist, but what does exist is nationalism, and it's bad because Americans or Brits or anybody else, for that matter, Mexicans, Germans, you name it, might be able to vote and kick out the corporations that have hijacked their country. So again, more fake news from the New York Times that lied about Saddam's WMDs, his aluminum tubes, and his yellow cake. Undoubtedly, the new main PSYOP against independent media is flooding the web with fake news and mainstream media putting out fake news and setting themselves up like a super Snopes to be the arbiter of what's real and what's not. That's why Infowars.com is announcing a daily piece for the radio show and the nightly news where we will analyze fake corporate news and fake ads 
and then archive and chronicle that so that you can search it and index it and counter these people. And I would encourage you as well in the fake news wars to start your own YouTube channel, to start your own radio show, or if you already have one, to make it a daily part of what you do to analyze the deception and the fraud that is the corporate collaborator media. And together, we will kick their ass. Welcome to the InfoWars Nightly News. It is Tuesday, November 15th, 2016, and I'm Leanne McAdoo. Here's what's coming up tonight. Tonight, as anti-Trump protests continue across the country, arrests are being made for rioting, destruction of property, and assault. And it turns out that most of the people who are getting arrested didn't even bother to vote in the presidential election. Then, the establishment media wants you to live in the land of make-believe. And they say everything apart from them is fake news. Plus, I am going to create deportation task force focused on identifying and quickly removing the most dangerous criminal in America. Illegal immigrants are demanding that Barack Obama issue mass pardons to stop Donald Trump from deporting them out of the country. All that plus much more up next on the InfoWars Nightly News. To all those who are after Tuesday's election, very nervous, there's filled with anxiety has been spoken to. You are safe in Chicago. You are secure in Chicago and you are supported in Chicago. Led by hubris-riddled quasi-leaders like Chicago Mayor Rahm Emanuel, a portion of the American people have chosen to ignore that we are a nation of laws. The 1952 naturalization law states, before applying, an alien must be at least 18 years old and must have been lawfully admitted to live permanently in the United States. They must have lived in the United States for five years and for the last six months in the state where they seek to be naturalized. In some cases, they need only have lived three years in the United States, but must be of good moral character and attached to the principles of the Constitution. The law states that an alien is not of good moral character if they are a drunkard, committed adultery, have more than one wife, make a living by gambling, have lied to the Immigration and Naturalization Service, have been in jail more than 180 days for any reason during their five years in the United States, or they are a convicted murderer. Well, it should be clearly obvious the enforcement of deportation is long overdue. WorldNet Daily reported way back in 2006, according to statistics released by Representative Steve King, four 4,380 Americans are murdered annually by illegal aliens. He also said that 13 are killed by drunk illegal alien drivers for another annual death toll of 4,745. Ten years later, that number of U.S. citizen deaths due to illegal alien drivers has climbed to 20 per day, adding up to as many as 7,500 dead U.S. citizens due to unlicensed illegal alien drivers per year. The horror of it all is magnified by stories similar to this one from North Carolina. 26-year-old Roberto Carlos Flores O'Brien was taken into custody yesterday at a construction site in Sanford, North Carolina. Deputies say he hit a woman's car early Halloween morning, forcing her off the road. They say he spent the next two hours sexually assaulting her on the side of King's Highway. According to data collected by ncfire.org, illegal aliens are annually sexually assaulted American children by the thousands in North Carolina alone. And who is at the front of the anti-Trump protests demanding Americans forgo our own laws? Soros-funded communist organizations. But again, in the not-so-distant past, the Immigration and Nationality Act of 1952 was used to bar members and former members and fellow travelers of the Communist Party from entry into the United States, even those who had not been associated with the party for decades. The Immigration and Nationality Act of 1952 allows the government to deport immigrants or naturalized citizens engaged in subversive activities and also allow the barring of suspected subversives from entering the country. So why were the illegal aliens allowed to pour in? 
simple. Votes. Paul Joseph Watson discovered, according to current indications, Hillary Clinton won the popular vote by around 630,000 votes, although around 7 million ballots remain uncounted. Virtually all of the votes cast by 3 million illegal immigrants are likely to have been for Hillary Clinton. Although some states require some form of ID before voting, California, Illinois, Iowa, Maine, Maryland, Massachusetts, Minnesota, Nebraska, Nevada, New Jersey, New Mexico, New York, North Carolina, Carolina, Oregon, Pennsylvania, Vermont, West Virginia, Wyoming, and Washington, D.C. all require no identification before voting. Those numbers beg the question, if Hillary supposedly won the popular vote by 630,000 votes, does that mean that Hillary actually lost the popular U.S. citizen vote by 2,370,000 after those illegal votes are discounted? Face it, social justice warriors, you lost. And furthermore, you are criminally aiding and abetting horrific crimes and subversion against long-established laws designed to protect your fellow citizens of the United States of America. John Bound for Infowars.com. Yesterday we had the much talked about call between Putin and Trump, talking about how they could work together against their common enemy, ISIS, talking about how they could promote stability and safety around the world. That, quite frankly, would be a reversal, wouldn't it, of Obama and Hillary's policies that promoted instability the policies that set the Middle East on fire. And of course, in the most charitable uh, look back at ISIS, the creation of ISIS, we could say that it was due to their incompetence. But we know better than that. We know that the Obama administration funded, trained, equipped, and continues to run interference for ISIS as they use them as a surrogate in Syria for yet another regime change. But there's another enemy besides ISIS that we have in common, and that is George Soros and his color revolutions. What we have seen in the last week is the beginning of that. And we're gonna talk about not only the pattern of uh, tactics that Soros and his organizations have used, but how that matches in what we see in America right now. And I understand that the color revolutions are something we've seen throughout the former Soviet Union since about 2000. It is a tactic that has been used. Understand they use students, they use non-governmental organizations. It's a pattern of behavior that is now happening here in America. And of course, the Russian government has said that they consider the uh, tactics of a color revolution to essentially be a form of warfare. It has usually been done in response, they say, to an unfair election, a disputed election. However, the common thing that is always a part of this is to say that they're going to overthrow an authoritarian regime. So as part of that, it is essential for them to portray Trump as an authoritarian, as a Hitler figure. Here's a quote from Anthony Cordesman of the Center for Strategic and International Studies. He said, Russian military leaders view the color revolutions as a new U.S. and European approach to warfare that focuses on creating destabilizing revolutions in other states as a means of serving their security interests at low cost with minimal casualties. So how has this looked in the last week or so? We've had reports here in Austin of massive buses being close to the areas where they had uh, riots. Of course, uh, the local Fox station pushed back on that, said, well, those were for another event. Well, whatever. They didn't really talk to anybody at the buses to say, what were you here for? We've had other reports of the same thing happening in other cities across this country as violent uh, protests have erupted. We see this happening in Chicago. We reported on this earlier. But I want to go back to a story that was done by Free Thought at the end of the week last week, where they looked at whether or not this is a grassroots, organic uh, revolution, protest, or response to the election, or whether or not this is AstroTurf. Is this a rent-a-mob? As they show in the article, they show a press release from MoveOn.org calling for this to happen, saying the gatherings are being organized by MoveOn.org, so they take full responsibility for this. How does it look? Well, they say Soros-affiliated organizations across the world have been deeply connected to various color revolutions like the Arab Spring and so forth, as I mentioned in the former Soviet Union. But very key to this is to understand hacked documents that show that Soros is a puppet master pulling the strings in the Kiev revolution, going back to the Ukraine. They say that he's been in the Ukraine working with the International Resistance Foundation, the IRF, since, the, since 1989, he's given more than $100 million to Ukrainian NGOs. Two years before the fall of the Soviet Union, he created the preconditions of Ukraine's independence from Russia in 1991, and he admitted to financing the Maiden Square protests. Now, this continues on into the Orange Revolutions, 
and we don't have time to go into all the documents. And yet, what we see here from WikiLeaks, we also see Hillary Clinton's involvement. She received $25 million from George Soros. And we see from some of the Hillary Clinton emails that they're in a subject called unrest in Albania. Soros makes it clear, Freethought points out, to Clinton that two things needed to be done urgently. He said, bring the full weight of the international community to bear on Prime Minister Berisha, appoint a senior European official as mediator, and then he tells then Secretary of State Hillary Clinton exactly who he wants to take the place of the person that they're overthrowing. He is the puppet master. But it's not just George Soros. We know that the deep state and others are involved in this. Going back to 2013, InfoWars reported that Senator McCain was pimping for the CIA-spawned color revolution in Ukraine. So it's not just the Democrats. It is the establishment at the top. It is the secret deep state involving the CIA. And they're the ones who are coming after Donald Trump. It is a setup. We need to understand the end game. We need to understand what their long-term strategy is. And this is the tactic that we have seen throughout Eastern Europe. This is a common enemy, just as ISIS is, of both the U.S. and Russia and other states. For InfoWars.com, I'm David Knight. This is Joe Biggs with InfoWars.com. Now, Bo Bergdahl's name has made its way back into the news yet again. The traitor is back in the headlines. Why? Because his lawyers want to somehow ask for a dismissal of his case. Now, he's been charged with desertion and misbehaving before the enemy. Now, joining me today is Jack Posobiec of Citizens for Trump. And what we're going to do is talk about what happened and catch you up to speed if you're not really too familiar with the case and then give you a breakdown of what's happening today. But before we do that, Jack, give me a little brief background for the viewers about your military uh, history, your career so far. Sure, Joe. So I appreciate uh, your military service as well. So I served with the United States Navy. I was in an, in an, an intelligence capacity and uh, served all over the place and actually spent uh, some time at sea as well as over a full year uh, down at Guantanamo Bay at a det detention facility down there. And while I was there, I actually had the opportunity to to meet and in some cases get to know fairly well some of the Taliban five that were held there and that were then exchanged for Bo Bergdahl in this process. Now, Bo Bergdahl is the soldier who deserted his post and left and decided to go off and wander into the mountains. Now, let's talk about some of this stuff here. It says, Bergdahl was in, uh, isolated by choice from his fellow soldiers. For instance, instead of socializing with his comrades during Thanksgiving, he studied maps of Afghanistan. Bergdahl told one of his soldiers before their deployment to Afghanistan that if his deployment is lame, he's just going to walk off into the mountains of Pakistan. Now it says that Bergdahl began to learn to speak Pashto over the course of his deployment. And according to another soldier, Bergdahl began to gravitate away from his unit, spending more time with the Afghans than he did with his own platoon. So that just gives you a kind of an idea about Bo Bergdahl and the mindset that he was in. And the fact that the lawyers are saying that, you know, the, de the desertion charges should be dropped. And that's what we're hearing today. Bo Bergdahl's lawyer has come forward and asked that Bo Bergdahl's whole case be dismissed based out of the fact that Donald Trump had made some comments. Now, those comments are as follows here. We're tired of Sergeant Bergdahl, who's a traitor, a no good traitor, who should have been executed. Trump said at a rally in October of 2015, 35 years ago, he would have been shot. So his uh, his lawyers are saying that because of these comments, that if Trump somehow becomes, or once he is inaugurated, I should say, that there's going to be an unfair uh, trial for Bo Bergdahl. So they want to get it dismissed before then. What are your thoughts on that? Well, I think, number one, this is clearly a case. Uh, his mindset was that he was somebody going native. I'm sure you've heard, had uh, people that were uh, doing that way basically when you were serving. But with Bo Bergdahl being, it's, it's another case of him saying that it's not my fault, that it's trying to be somebody else's fault. Now, they've delayed his hearing. They've delayed this trial many, many times mm -hmm. already. It was originally supposed to be held back in May. Then they pushed it back to August. Then they pushed it back to February. And I think that they realized that they were planning this all along, that if Donald Trump won, they were going to try to use these comments to try to sneak out of it again, the same way that he snuck out of his base and left all his buddies uh, to have to go and find him, many of which died actually trying to find Bo Bergdahl. So it's a case where instead of trying to take the blame for his actions and take blame for what he did, he's trying to shift the blame onto somebody else.
Well, it's not that. That's what we're seeing around the country in general now. Everybody's trying to focus the blame on Donald Trump for everything. Donald Trump didn't serve in Afghanistan. Donald Trump didn't desert his post. Donald Trump didn't leave uh, his post, which turned into a giant uh, man search for this man across the country. You know, people, like you said, were injured. Some died. Many are left paralyzed and unable to even communicate with their loved ones. So for me, this guy is a traitor. Plain and simple, when you look at the comments that he made to his soldiers before he deployed, when you look at the way he acted during that deployment, like you said, going native, so to say, where he's starting to uh, socialize more with the locals than with his own uh, unit, then you can kind of see this progress into the fact that something was happening. Now, you can actually go back and find interviews of some of the sergeants that worked with Bergdahl, and they said that as after he left, the attacks, the coordinated attacks on their compound began to get closer and closer and closer and closer as if Bergdahl was actually directing them and giving them coordinates to help them out. Yeah, it's hard to say whether or not he was giving that information from interrogations that were coming from him or information that he was giving freely. Either way, he provided himself as a source of critical tactical information to the enemy at a time when we, was, this was 2009, this guy walked mm -hmm. away. This is when uh, things were at their peak in Afghanistan. This is way before the drawdown. This is way before any of this stuff kicked in. So for him to walk away at a time like that, and he's given so many conflicting statements, but his earliest one, one of his earliest ones was, I'm going to go and talk to the Taliban and get them to stop what they're doing. He thought that he could take the law and take the entire effort into his own hands and do this like, uh, I don't know, dances with wolves kind of thing and go and meet the uh, the noble savages there. Yeah, they, they, they said that he's obsessed with Jason Bourne. Uh, a lot of the people in his unit and his family members said that he was obsessed with those movies and kind of considered himself as like elite soldier and spy, so to say. But regardless of what his mindset <laughs> was, his actions led to the death and the injuries of other soldiers. And the fact that they're going to come out and try to say that that's complete and total BS. I mean, look at this. U.S. Air Force Major John Marks testified about a firefight that occurred after he and several others joined about 50 members of the Afghan National Army in a search for Bo Bergdahl. They were attacked by enemy fighters after seeing or after setting up a checkpoint near a town in Afghanistan on July 8, 2009. Marks testified about uh, fighting alongside U.S. Army National Guard Sergeant First Class Mark Allen, who was shot in the head during the firefight. Now, prosecutors said Allen suffered a traumatic brain injury that has left him in a wheelchair and unable to communicate. Another soldier had hand injuries and required surgery because of an RPG attack that happened. I looked at him, then I saw trickles of blood coming down his head, Marks testified, when he was asked where Allen was wounded by uh, the lawyers. Right through his head, Bergdahl, dressed in a white shirt and blue pants, appeared a stoic as he listened on. And then the lawyers said, who attacked him? Who attacked him? It was the Taliban that attacked those soldiers. It's the Taliban's fault. Negative. It's the actions of Bo Bergdahl which led, led to that massive uh, search for him. He but these is guys, responsible. These guys were having to put themselves in more and more dangerous situations mm -hmm. because in it, when, after they thought, after the first 48 hours, when they thought that he had probably been picked up by the enemy, they were then having to go into areas where they were in closer contact with the enemy. And you had guys that were rappelling down mine shafts, down wells, going into tunnels, going into areas where they knew were landmines. You know, usually, right, you say, that, hey, that's Indian country. Don't go over there. That's hostile country. You got to armor up. Well, they were trying to find him as fast. They were trying to save this guy's life. And he's going to turn it around and not take responsibility for it. And that, to me, is the most shameless act. Yeah, I, I just don't get how anybody can sit there and not take responsibility for something like this. And the fact that President Obama welcomes this guy with open arms. Now, this had already been looked at. Michael Hastings, my buddy who died, was already looking into Bo Bergdahl. He's the one who wrote the Rolling Stone, uh, Rolling Stone article about Bo Bergdahl, which showed how he was uh, basically just withering away when he was deployed and began to initially shift from being pro-American to more on the side of the Taliban, so to say. And the government was looking into this. There had already been reports. People were actually uh, investigating this way before Bo Bergdahl even came back. So Obama knew the story. Obama had the facts. And they bring him back. We, we trade, we negotiate with terrorists. And you can give us more insight on this, the release of the Taliban 5. But to me, one of the most sickening things is, is instead of jailing this guy, what happens? He is promoted to sergeant. Who in the hell gets promoted when they have deserted and been charged with misbehaving before the enemy, which resulted in the death of soldiers and the injuries of soldiers that have left them paralyzed for the rest of their lives, Jack? 
Right. And so that's going off of a basic, uh, de- the normal POW scenario where someone receives their back pay and receives their, their rank. But we don't know if this was a normal POW scenario because he walked off on his own and turned himself and possibly turned himself over to the Taliban. Then what Barack Obama did knowingly was hand over five of the top Taliban generals that we held at Guantanamo Bay in exchange for him. Look, the Taliban wasn't going to ask for some of their foot soldiers back. They knew they had some leverage and they knew Obama wanted some kind of deal. So they asked for the five top guys. The guys they turned over, the guys that Barack Obama set free, were some of the baddest of the bad Taliban members. The lead one of those, I would say, is Mohammed Fazl. Mohammed Fazl is wanted by the United Nations for war crimes. Mohammed Fazl, and remember the scorched earth campaign that the Taliban used to take out the Northern Alliance 1999 through 2001, the way that they would go into, Mohammed Fazl was the leader of that. He would ride into villages of of Shiites, uh, then the Hazara minority there, and would just decimate these entire villages, lay waste to them. I mean, biblical proportion type stuff. Men, women, children, all all killed, all defiled, extreme brutality. And this guy would then go in, set landmines all throughout the buildings, scorched earth, uh, would burn all of the fields. And th- this is a guy, Fazl, who's in um, Afghanistan textbooks for being one of the most brutal fighters of the Taliban. <laughs> Welcome back to the Nightly News, everybody. I am now joined by Thomas Arrington. He is a student at Queensboro Community College. His Twitter handle is T. Jägermeister, and he was recently attacked on his college campus for wearing his Make America Great Again hat on. Thomas, you've got your hat on today. I hope you don't get attacked in your domicile right now. But real quick, tell me about your experience. What happened that day when you were attacked? Well, I was having a friendly discussion with a couple of my peers, and um, a few guys ran up and uh, threatened to set my hat on fire. I kind of uh, ignored them and went back to having my discussion. Uh, One of the guys flanked me and came behind me and tried to light me up. So you were just having a friendly discussion. Was it a politically-based discussion? Yeah, a peaceful discussion about why I like Trump. So here you are trying to have a civil conversation with someone who may disagree with you, may not. You're just trying to have a conversation, no big deal. And these people decide that they're going to assault you. Do you think it's because they heard what you were saying or did they just see your hat? I think they just see the hat. They just said they wanted to light my hat on fire. Did they actually get to, I mean, the hat, it looks like it's pretty pristine right now. It's still a good looking hat. I guess they didn't actually get it lit up. Yeah, the guy kind of flanked me, but I let him know I was, uh, wasn't a chump, and he kind of backed off. So tell me, do you wear your hat around campus a lot? Yeah, all the time, almost every time I'm on campus. And is this something that you experience every time you wear it? Um, I get a lot of funny faces, but this is the first time somebody actually threatened me. Has this intimidated you from wearing your hat around campus more often? No, not at all. Well, I'm glad to hear that. I also see that uh, you have a Hillary for prison shirt on, so I yeah. guess uh, I guess you are an info warrior. Yeah, I have been for a couple years now. Do you wear the uh, Hillary for prison shirt around campus too? Yeah, I wear it around campus. I often wear it to Manhattan, getting a lot of debates, but this is the first time I've been threatened. So tell me real quick, what is the overall attitude at the Queensboro Community College? What was it like during this political uh, election cycle? Was it very politically charged? Did people not seem to care? Were other people wearing out political clothing? What did you witness? No, I really didn't encounter any political clothing. Um, There wasn't too much of a charged atmosphere. Usually uh, Usually it was the staff I spoke about. So you're pretty much the only one that goes around campus showing off your support for any candidate? Yeah, pretty much, from what I've seen. Now, there's been an interesting development here. After you tried to file a report of the people that tried to accost you on campus, it was kind of dismissed by the police, and it didn't make it to the dean's office. When you followed up, uh, I guess it was it happened on a Thursday, the incident. You followed up on a Monday, and nothing was done. Talk about that experience. Yeah, um, immediately after the incident, I went to uh, public safety at the campus. Um, They made me write a report, so I figured the report would get to where it needed to go. I followed up 
um, Monday evening, and the dean had said that he had not seen such a report. Um, as I was speaking to the dean, the sergeant who I followed with, he walked up, and the dean kind of admonished him for not um, getting the incident report to him in a timely manner. Did they give you a reason why this report wasn't sent to the dean, or do you think you know the reason? What was the what was the excuse? Well, they didn't give me a reason. However, um, when I initially followed up in public safety, they were kind of um, dismissive of me, had a smile on their face, asking me, what am I doing here? Do you think they were ignoring you because you were a Trump supporter, or why do you think it was met with pretty much disregard? Uh, maybe they're trying to cover up statistics, or maybe they're just ignoring me because I'm a Trump supporter. It is interesting, and maybe you can give me your opinion on this, but I feel like if it were the opposite, if it were, uh, you know, a Hillary shirt or something like that, and you came up to them and tried to light their shirt on fire or their Hillary whatever on fire, I have a feeling that that would have been followed up on. Yeah, I think it would have been the end of the world. <laughs> Probably would have been reported on all the news networks, right? Yes, of course. It's amazing how that works, but yet now... Have you heard anything developing since that Monday when you followed up? Has the dean um, done anything for your case? No, um, he just apologized, I guess, on behalf of the students. And at first he said that uh, they wanted to do some sort of counseling when they find the guys. But I said, <laughs> no, this is a threat on my life. These guys don't need to be at a college campus, you know? So let me get this straight. They basically accost you. They threaten to light your hat on fire. I mean, who yeah. knows what could have happened if they actually accomplished that, which they apparently tried to, light your hat on fire. Um, but also, to me, this is a hate crime by definition, and you're saying that their response is counseling for these students? Yeah, you know, my criminology professor last night, he reminded me that this is a hate crime. Whether the threat was uh, taken through it or whether it was just a threat, it's still a hate crime. Wow, so this was actually discussed in your class. Yeah, I had criminology yesterday evening. Wow. is uh, Has your criminology professor taken an interest in your case at all? Uh, somewhat. He's a former NYPD detective. Now, are you considering uh, possible litigation? Are you considering um, taking it further with the police? Are you considering charging these students with a hate crime? What, what are you thinking? Are you just going to let this go to rest? No, I wasn't going to let it go to rest. That's why I followed up yesterday evening. And I see that the public safety, um, they're not taking it serious, so I've actually reached out to the local police precinct to file a criminal report. Well, that's amazing, and, you know, you could be an example case here, which is a pretty big deal. If you actually litigate with these people and you get a, a possible hate crime coming here, that could be a big step forward for other people who have endured similar things to you, been beaten up in the streets, uh, beaten up at their schools, too. Uh, have you considered the gravity of this case? Yeah, I know it's really big. Um, I've got a lot of support on uh, social media, but um, only one local media outlet has uh, taken up my story, unfortunately. Well, you certainly have our support at Infowars.com, and uh, we'll make sure that we shed light on whatever developments come in this case. Now, in the story, in The Observer, you talked about how you are a contributor to your society, You've um, been heavily involved with the nonprofit nonprofit branch of your local parks department. And, you know, it's sad because here you are contributing to your community. I'd like for you to comment on that. But you mentioned how you were hoping this testifies to your character. I think it's sad that just because you're a Trump supporter, you have to stick up for your character as if you're some sort of a bad person. But tell us about your experience uh, working in the, uh, work with the with the nonprofit branch of the parks department. Yeah, so a few years back, um, I had started a local community group called Friends of Idlewild Park. We work usually on environmental issues and just try to have people more involved in the community. So there you go. What do you know? A Donald Trump supporter who's out there involved in the community, trying to build a better community for his peers, and uh, he gets his hat, try to get lit on fire for that. Now, I, uh, you had actually a powerful quote, and I'm just going to read this quote that they quoted you in The Observer. I thought it was brilliant. This is what you said when you were asked why you were a Trump supporter. You said, 
Hillary Clinton stated several, several times that if she's president, we're going to attack Iran. She also said she'd be willing to attack countries physically for a cyber attack. I don't think that's military doctrine anywhere in the world. She scares me. I have little brothers who are draft age. My girlfriend is draft age. I don't want them to get drafted. I don't want $10 a gallon gas. Really, out of anti-establishment and against continuation of all of Obama's foreign words. I thought that that was brilliantly stated. Is there anything you'd like to add to that? Well, yeah, you know, I support Trump. He's a hometown hero. I'm here in Queens, New York. He's from Queens, New York. He's a very successful guy. He stands up for the people. So that's why I support him. Well, I thought it was brilliant the way you worded that. Very common sense that the average human you think would be able to absorb. And um, I, I thank you for your support of being brave in Trump. You can support whoever you want, but you're brave enough to go out there. Do you plan on continuing to wear your Make America Great Again hat, your Hillary for Prison shirt around campus? Yeah, it matches nice, right? <laughs> <laughs> that is a nice shirt. Yeah, show that shirt off for the camera, Hillary for Prison. That's the shirt at InfoWarsStore.com. Well, thank you so much, Thomas. We're going to keep, uh, keep tabs on this case with you, all right? All righty. Thanks a lot. All right. There goes Thomas Arrington sticking up for making America great again. Well, folks, that does it for the nightly news tonight. Be sure to support this broadcast at InfoWarsStore.com. And be sure to tune in tomorrow night, 7 o'clock central, InfoWars.com show.